started. Can you hear me? Yeah. Just a reminder, we're, as always, live streaming, so, um, you know, don't say anything you wouldn't want heard around the world, I guess, is the lesson from that. Uh, welcome to the Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee, where we are rapidly on our way to being the Baker School of Public Policy in short order. Um, we're waiting on a couple more approvals, and then that'll go through. So we're very excited about that. We're honored tonight to host these guests um, in conjunction with the Department of History and the new, or new-ish, Department of Africana Studies. Uh, what a great way to honor Black History Month to have three civil rights historians here in our midst. We have um, Cynthia Fleming and Brandon Winford, who will be interviewing National Civil Rights Museum President Russ Wigginton. And they're going to bring their insights on the greatest civil rights story ever told, its legacy in our society today, and the public history that supports it. So let me introduce our guests. Dr. Cynthia Fleming was a pioneer for black women scholars and has a career of both making and teaching history. In 1977, she became the first black woman to earn a PhD in history at Duke University. In 1982, she became one of the first two black women faculty members here at UT's College of Arts and Sciences and the first black woman professor in the history department. She would spend her 32 years of service here until her retirement in 2014. Dr. Brandon Winford is an associate professor in UT's history department. He's a historian of late 19th and 20th century United States and African American history, specializing in civil rights and black business history. And he co-founded the Fleming Morrow Endowment in African American History in honor of two pioneering black professors in, in arts and sciences. And then our guest of honor, Dr. Russ Wigginton, serves as the president of the National Civil Rights Museum. From 2006 to 2019, he was vice president for external programs and college relations at Rhodes College, and then became vice president for student life and dean of students. And he taught in the history department at Rhodes, so he is no stranger to all the parts of a university. Um, he was there teaching for eight years, specializing in African American and community history, and he published a book entitled The Strange Career of the Black Athlete, African Americans and Sports, as well as articles and essays on African American social and labor history. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Drs. Fleming, Winford, and Wigginton. Good evening. Can you all hear us okay? Yeah, sounds like it's working pretty good. It's uh, the live stream that helps. Oh, oh, that's right. Okay. All right, good evening. Um, so, uh, Thank you again, uh, Dr. Wigginton, for being here, and also uh, Dr. Fleming, because she's retired, and so you know, she got better things to do. Um, so uh, we're just going to have a, a really great conversation. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about civil rights history. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, public history, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of our, our contemporary issues, and uh, we're just sort of going to uh, go from there. And I want to start with this uh, kind of first question, um, and it really is based on how this conversation was framed like in our publicity, uh, in our publicity materials, and it was kind of misleading, and so I'm going to read this description. It said, quote, the birthplace of the civil rights movement and the location of Dr. King's assassination, Tennessee's public history carries the civil rights story. The National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis leads the state in providing Tennesseans and all Americans remarkable access to the greatest civil rights story ever told. And that's when I say that's our marketing, that was all of us. Um, but in terms of place, how should we really understand Memphis and the state of Tennessee within the broader civil rights movement narrative? And also speak on this idea that Memphis isn't the story of the civil rights movement. Okay. So if you think about the greatest civil rights story ever told, uh, it's not a snapshot. And if you've experienced our museum, you know that we don't frame civil rights through 
a narrow lens of 1954 to 1968. The greatest civil rights story ever told is a comprehensive look and, and the integration, if you will, of the plight of Africans and African Americans in U United States history and its founding. And so what we, when we think about the greatest civil rights story ever told, it's the ability to understand, be made aware of, understand and, appreci and appreciate, be inspired by, be humbled by the trials and tribulations over a 400 year history. Centered in that is 250 years of which slavery was the institution that most Africans and African Americans were a part of. And so the context is really important because when you get to the post-slavery dynamic and you begin to investigate all of the strategies, all of the uh, efforts of sacrifice, all of the resiliency, you have a context in which to understand what people were fighting for and why it was worth fighting for. And when you think about the shoulders that Dr. King stood on, and you think about his ability to make a transitional pivot in the conversation and the strategies and the approaches to civil rights. And you think about the fact that he did all of this before the age of 40. And you think about the fact that he touched the world stage as a Nobel Peace Prize winner. And that he died on the balcony of a little old black motel in Memphis, Tennessee, trying to get justice for garbage workers. Oh yeah, it's the greatest civil rights story ever told. Let me just follow up on that, Dr. Wigington, though, with the whole question about Dr. King's position in all of this. There's this idea, see I'm a lot older than everybody in here, I know that. And I remember when Dr. King was assassinated. I remember mm -hmm. when Malcolm X was assassinated. I remember some people saying, oh my gosh, the movement's dead, we can't go on without him. But as an oral historian through my long career, I was privileged to interview almost all of Dr. King's inner circle to get the real story mm -hmm. about what happened and interview a whole bunch of folks whose names you will never know. And if we could resurrect Dr. King himself and bring him back here and ask him about this, he'd be the first one to say, I didn't do it. That's right. All these other people. How does the museum deal with that? Because there's that King-centered approach that we as a society yeah. have but you, the museum, have to deal with what the sure. real story is. So if you look at our, our mission, it is not the Martin Luther King Jr. Museum. It is through his nonviolent approach that we tackle issues of civil and human rights and social justice and that we serve as a catalyst for change and to educate. And so if you experience our museum, without a doubt, seeing in, in the interplay and the, uh, the, um, the emotion of witnessing room 306 is extremely important. But throughout the museum, starting with the first exhibit with a in-depth discussion on the, the, the Atlantic slave trade, all throughout the people who are lifted up whose names you otherwise would not have known, the focus on the various strategies and approaches all throughout the, the, the South and the country. So the, the museum's approach from day one has been, we obviously have to recognize Dr. King who lost his life here, but this is a struggle of a people. And let us introduce some of you to the people who 
were most influential for Dr. King and whose shoulders he stood upon. And the people whose names, as you describe it, and faces you otherwise would never have any idea of who they are. And so to us, it's really about a sense of empowerment for all the individuals who may visit our museum, that each person can make a difference. They have a role and a responsibility through their respective lenses of being a positive contributor to society, of treating people with dignity and respect. So Dr. King's presence is obviously there. We wouldn't have it any other way. But much like you said, Dr. Fleming, the reach and influence and the power of so many other people is really where the magic happens, we think, at the National Civil Rights Museum. And I was there as recently as last July. And one of the things I was impressed by was, yes, you, you get there and it's, it's, it's the largest civil rights story, but we there's a permanent exhibit, exhibit from 1619 to 1865, right? Mm -hmm. And so as an entry point, it's the civil rights movement. But then you're you're there in that space and you learn about, no, it's, just, it's not just the civil rights movement, but it's the, the experiences of African Americans. Um, and, and sorry to begin on, on that on that note, just kind of with those heavy questions. I but, appreciate it. I'm oh. on a college campus. That's how it's <laughs> supposed to be. Our audience, uh, for most of part, we all have a general understanding of the museum as an important aspect of public history. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about, and you've talked about this earlier, the role and function of the National Civil Rights Museum in similar institutions? I think we have a tremendous responsibility uh, that I would argue is becoming more and more important uh, in, in our current society. Uh, as a place that is first and foremost an educational institution, we have an obligation to take a leadership role in this country about how do you how do you teach and what do you teach as it relates to African American and civil rights history. And we live in a country uh, that has situated traditionally African American history on the periphery. And the challenge to it being more centered is underway. The threat of it being centered in a more intentional way is, is happening. And the noise and friction and, and, and uh, dissension about that. But as a place that's a Smithsonian affiliate, the oldest civil rights museum in the country or, or culture, civil rights oriented museum in the country, the place where something transformative happened, the place that's an international site of consciousness, as a place that is rooted in Dr. King's approach to humanity and justice. And a place that has a responsibility to say it and say it loud, speak the truth, speak it with facts, data, archives. I'm excited about the opportunity for us to be in the national conversation about how do you how do you teach uncomfortable topics? That's what we do every day. And what I think is really important to understand is we get 300,000 visitors a year. 40,000 of those visitors come from outside of the U.S. And it runs the full spectrum on knowledge, race, religion, political affiliation, ideology, et cetera. People come from all spectrums to our museum every day. So our museum is curated and designed to meet people where they are. And we have the opportunity to create space for people to digest and learn about and appreciate, and dare I say, even disagree with through the lens of civility. Have I said civility yet? It's kind of important to us. And we lead with that, we demand it, and we're, we, we accept the challenge of pushing our society to bring that back to the center of the conversation. 
One of the things that strikes me about the Civil Rights Museum, and I've been to civil rights museums all over the country, is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I think the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis is the only place where there, that is actually built upon the place where a major event happened. And that, that is, is correct. the assassination of Dr. King. I can remember taking a couple of classes from here through that museum, and we got to room 306, and it's almost as though I didn't have to say anything you get this feeling of being on this hallowed ground where an earth-shattering event happened. It's unlike anything else that I've experienced. Given that, and you have people coming through there all the time experiencing that, feeling that, how do you see the prospect of harnessing that in order to get people to begin to connect to some of the issues we have going on now, like, for instance, Tyree Nichols, dare I say it. So what you just described is an everyday occurrence for us. And um, I think rooted in the, the Room 306 experience, whether you're inside the museum or you're walking up our courtyard and you see the wreath that, that lays outside of the, 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 that motel room, is we have become and are recognized as a place where people come to seek comfort and a place of healing, very authentically. So when George Floyd murder occurred, the National Civil Rights Museum did not call a press conference. The National Civil Rights Museum looked outside of our windows and thousands of people came. And they came peacefully. They came because they needed a place to go where they could process, make meaning, be in community. It's very authentic and very natural. I was talking to some students earlier and, and I was telling them that one of the things that, that will never get old for me is standing outside of the museum and watching as people get out of their cars or get off the school bus and, and as they are walking towards and up our courtyard, the, how their entire physical disposition changes. People stand up straight. I was joking to the, the students earlier, the eighth graders who would normally be punching and fussing with each other, the teachers don't have to call their names. They know there's somewhere where that there's a certain kind of reverence. And you can't engineer that. And so we capitalize on that. We've got your undivided attention. You may not know what's about to happen, but we've got your attention. And so with that attention, we create this space where there's warmth. We know people may be nervous and anxious about what's about to happen. Our staff is prepared to make you feel like you are the most important person in the room. And we have curated the exhibit with the understanding that individually and collectively, there may be different moments that hit people in different ways. All of this has to be intentional if you are going to truly be a, a convening place and a place that's recognized where tough conversations and emotion-provoking emotion opportunities will unfold. So we focus and think about that all of the time. And the community has come to expect us to operate in that way. And keep in mind, every single day, there's such a breadth and of diversity of people who are in our space at any given time. And so we have a we get the daily practice, if you will, of engaging with people and and getting feedback and understanding what people are experiencing in the moment. And we take that information and we we incorporate that into some of our programmings, some of our potential exhibit uh, uh, rotating exhibits, if you will. All of these things are are built with that in mind, that we have to be a place 
where everybody feels like they can come and, and be recognized regardless of where they stand on any particular issue. I had a, some follow-ups to, um, to mention uh, Tyree Nichols and, and being beaten by Memphis police and, and later dying as, as a result of that uh, brutal beating. Well, first, as a citizen of Memphis, I, I wanted to just ask you, generally speaking, how were, how were you and your family impacted? Um, you've been a citizen of Memphis for quite a long time. How were y'all impacted by uh, this incident, um, this first? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's still being processed uh, by me and I think so much, so many in our community. I mean, it's, um, you can't help but to um, think about moments like Emmett Till uh, and so many others. You can't help but to think about the, just the history of, of, of violence um, and the assassination of Dr. King. But I will say that the, I have found a unbelievable um, resilience in our overall community. You know, for some people, their first impression and image of our city is they turn straight to our crime and our violence. We're well aware of that. That's the first thing a lot of times people think about when they think of Memphis. But if you think about what just happened there and you think about how our community responded with nonviolent multiple forms of protest, how our community has come together and supported each other, how our community is focused on Tyree Nichols' parents and family. It's been a model for our society. There were a lot more other things related to this happening in other parts of the country than happened in Memphis. Memphis is a resilient city. I mean, it's a tough city, but it's a city that, that's prideful and it's got a soul and a spirit and an ability to come back time after time. And that's what our city is doing. I also thought about the fact that Al Sharpton called the museum and said, I need to come to the museum before I do this eulogy. Because I need to get the I need to get my strength and the spirit from the museum. And so I work at a place that at 4:30 on the morning of his funeral, I had staff members meet him in the ice in dangerous conditions so that he could have his moment at the National Civil Rights Museum before he went and gave Tyree Nichols eulogy. So that's the kind of place it is. And those are the kind of moments that have helped me personally appreciate that I have a responsibility as the leader of this amazing sacred space to be there for our community. One last thing. The number of activists who reached out to, directly to me to tell me, here's what we are planning, here's where we will be, if we come to the museum to, to, to pull the community together, here's what time it will be. That's about relationships and a place that has earned the trust of the community. And so I don't take that lightly. So we have work to do. We are embarking on a year-long uh, effort because as people have come and, 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 and acknowledged and have left, we're still there. We have to be there. So we are embarked on a multi-part series in which the culmination next February will be a national gathering to both talk through, talk about, be in community, heal, solution-oriented response to this particular moment that systematically affects our entire community. That's the work of the National Civil Rights Museum. And, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, you should, okay. mm -hmm. 
one of the unprecedented challenges facing those of us who are scholars of the African American experience right now is the trend toward trying to erase us yet again from the history books. I mean, I call your attention to what's happening down in Florida with Ron DeSantis, but unfortunately it's spreading. And before I ask you this question, I want to put this in a little bit of historical context. I'm old enough to remember when we were erased. My career parallels that time when we were brought into, we being Af the African American experience, were brought into academia. But there's a tendency to try to erase us once again. What role can an institution like the Civil Rights Museum play in trying to ensure that that does not happen? I think we can play a critical role and, and frankly, have a responsibility. Uh, when you think about so much of the conversation, if you will, about what you can teach and who you can teach it to and who can do the teaching and all the things that you're describing that are that are um, on the table, if you will. As a, again, as a recognized, credible, fact and source-based institution that doesn't need school board approval. but has to speak to society at large. I mean, one of the things I say about the museum is no particular group should worry about being uncomfortable at the museum. We got enough discomfort for everybody. Like you can't go through our museum if you're, if you're awake and not have some uncomfortable moments. I dare you to, do, to try it. It will, because it, because it's situated that there's going to be some things that are going to hit you personally that you may not see coming. So we're built for that, for that reason. And we also have a responsibility to be a place of convening where those conversations can happen across the aisle, across the, the ideology, across the table, as uncomfortable as they are. We're the place that wants all those people in the room, and we're going to set the tone for the conversation, and it's going to be through civility. We're going to demand that. So we welcome the opportunity. We raise our hand for those kind of conversations to happen. But also understand, we got the archives, we got the facts, we got the data, and, we have, and, and we're going to put it out there. And all of it's not going to always feel good to all the people. But that's what we have to do. And if you don't know much about civil rights history and you're curious, there's a space for you. If you think you know quite a bit, you don't know as much as you think, we can help you there too. And if you're an expert, like, Dr. like these scholars up here, I promise you, they've been to the museum. There's something they pick up on or piques their interest and curiosity every time they go to the museum, too. And we have a curriculum that's appropriate for the six-year-olds. All the above. So, yeah, we raise our hand. We're embarking on a renovation that will focus on the legacy building, the building across from the motel and, and the park beside it. It is imperative that we do this because it will focus on answering the question of Dr. King, the title of Dr. King's last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos, Our Community. And we're on this continuum always as a society between chaos and community. And when people leave Room 306, they say, what happened to the movement? And that building is set out to help answer that question. The themes, the efforts, the movements that came out of the traditional civil rights movement will appear there. And the reason we have to do that is I think about the 12-year-old the all the time 
Because right now, they may have a grandparent who can vividly remember what happened on April 4, 1968. But in the next decade, by the time they are students here, the likelihood that they'll have somebody to recall that, those numbers will be fewer and fewer. And if we don't present the story now and capture their imagination and the importance and relevance of that story, by the time they are students here, it will be revised and perhaps even further on the periphery. April 4, 2023 is the 55-year commemoration of Dr. King's death. If you're a 12-year-old today, you ha think about what 55 years ago means to you. It may as well be World War I. There's no connection. So without the intentionality of lifting it up and centering it as part of the American experiment, we run the risk of minimalizing the contributions of so many people across the spectrum that have made this country what it is on its best day. I don't know if you uh, <clears throat> really have a response to this. And, and part of what we're talking about is um, laws being passed uh, against the teaching of critical race theory, laws that have banned particular books, writings like the 1619 Project, efforts to interject um, in Florida, efforts to interject in um, the AP African American history curriculum. Um, so now you, you made the point about we have the evidence, we have the facts, we have, but what, what happens when that doesn't really matter to the folks who are passing some of these laws? Like how, what, how do we continue to uh, ensure that right this this movement that we put in place to implement right these previously marginalized voices how do we go beyond the folks who who don't even care about the evidence and the facts and the, like I don't know if I'm asking a question but well I I would I would respond to your non question by saying. This is also a moment where an unprecedented moment of the establishment and legitimacy of cultural centers connected to people of color in this country. When you think about the growth of similar kinds of spaces, if you will, that we have at the National Civil Rights Museum, it's, a, it's, an un, it's unprecedented growth and, and acknowledgement all across the country. You also have, um, what I find, what, what I always go back to is, it's not lost on me that we're talking about movement culture. Come to the National Civil Rights Museum, those lessons that you can learn there, they still apply, they still work, they're still effective. If you're a college student, come, come check out the the sit-ins and Freedom Summer in Mississippi. And if you're wondering what you can do, the lessons from that era can be applied in the way that you seem see appropriate, you and your peers, and, and the galvanizing of that effort can, can, can make what you want to see for tomorrow ring true. This is a monumental moment, but let's, let's not underestimate the moments that they were going through, trying to desegregate lunch counters and, and, ride, and, and ride on the bus wherever you want it to, literally putting your life on the line. So there's some lessons to be learned that can be applied in this context. Um, 
I often think in terms of, of marathon instead of sprint. Um, what I'm not doing is in any way minimalizing the intensity of the moment. But this is a long game play. It has to be a long game play. The civil rights movement and its effectiveness was a long game play. Putting one foot in front of the other, fighting a good fight every day is still the best strategy in my opinion. As a historian, I can't help but try to put all of this in historical context. I'm probably the oldest person in this room, am I? Probably, maybe, anyway, close to. Anyhow, I remember back to the time where the idea of having a museum about the African-American experience is something that didn't even occur to anybody. I mean, what's that? I was a freshman in college when Dr. King was assassinated. So there were no African-American museums at the time. We are now taking these kinds of institutions for granted because you grew up in a society where it exists. So what I'd like for Dr. Wigington to talk about is what was the struggle to make a museum like this? Huh. So the National Civil Rights Museum was founded in 1991. Dr. King died in 1968. Essentially, it was in disrepair and an eyesore both visually and psychologically for our city. It lay dormant basically and was a, a place of ill repute, you might say, for 20 years. And three business leaders, the Army Bailey, Chuck Scruggs, and A.W. Willis, because of the threat of it being torn down and made a parking lot, parking garage. They began raising money. They worked with individuals. They worked with the state. They worked with everybody. And they pulled it together. And they said, we're going to establish this as a museum. To the, to the chagrin of many people, and what I can tell you, if you go back and look at some of the articles when the museum opened, I promise you nobody was project projecting that 32 years later that I would be talking about our plan in the next three to five years of having half a million visitors. They wouldn't have been talking about the fact that we have an $11 million operating budget and a $20 million endowment and no debt and a uh, committed board and national partners. They wouldn't have been talking about being a Smithsonian affiliate who works with museums all across the country. So yeah, but that was because people were committed and they were relentless. And don't get me wrong, this, that part didn't happen overnight either, either. It was one foot in front of the other doing a significant renovation. My friend Beverly Robinson led that renovation that was completed in 2014 that took our visitorship from 200,000 to 330,000 in five years. So you, can't, you, you have to understand all of those things to say, yeah, this is, a, this is an important moment, but we're not going anywhere. Well, we are going somewhere. We're going, we're going national, and we're centering ourselves in a much more intentional way. What we're not worried about is whether or not we're going to be erased. The museum in D.C., there are people who, you, people who know what they're talking about would have never predicted the magnitude of that of that facility. And so it's you have you have to calibrate the challenge if you will with the reality that there's there's a um, there's a network and a support system 
that's now national and international that you can tap into. And if you're a person who's looking to find your voice and be engaged, you have more resources at your fingertips now than you ever did, uh, than, than you would have had certainly in the 1950s or 60s. You couldn't send a text message. You couldn't, you know, you couldn't communicate as easily as you, as you can now. And you were leaving it the chance. And you just had to believe that what you were doing was, was and stood for right. I think what we're doing now stands for right, too. We have, uh, we're going to ask one more question, then we're going to open it up for um, Q&A, because I know uh, audience members have a lot of questions that they want to ask. Um, so kind of in thinking about where people can go, you go to the museum. So let me just ask the question. What do you say to folks who see institutions like the National Civil Rights Museum, right? They support it, right? Even folks who, who may not support, on a contemporary sense, issues of civil rights, they support the museum, they think it's important, but in some ways it becomes this kind of crutch, a way to absolve them from addressing and dealing with themselves uh, our contemporary civil rights issues. What would you say to someone to get them to move beyond the museum as this crutch and as a way to absolve themselves? In other words, how do you then take the museum and get people to move beyond the museum and to engage their community? So this is probably not going to be popular, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I fundamentally assume the good in everybody I meet. And if your motivation is not aligned with mine, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about it or worrying about it. I actually think it's more important to understand that everybody has their own journey of, of how they got where they are. And I really want us to focus at the museum on meeting people wherever they are and, and, and through a multi-strategy approach, helping them get where they can possibly go. There's nothing more exciting to me than to see a high school student who's on a field trip walking in the museum, eye rolling, feet dragging. Clearly, they want to be somewhere else. And then watching them as they go through the museum and almost reluctantly becoming engaged. And, you know, I'm an old history professor, so I usually seek them out and say, so what do you think? And they're, they're sometimes surprised themselves of what they see, what it causes them to think about, how it might relate to their life in some form or fashion or someone in their family. So I don't spend a lot of time worrying about what people are motivated by, why they came, how long they stay. If they give us a gift and it feels like guilt money, I don't care. I'll take it all, every dime of it for the good. And, and recognize that here's what I know is going to happen. Part of it is because of the confidence. It's the confidence that I have in what the museum provides. Here's what's going to happen for everybody who experiences the museum. You're going to have a collision between your head and your heart. Something you read or see is intellectually going to be curious and connect with you. And something is going to touch your heart. And when you have head-heart collisions, they stick with you. You don't forget about them the next day. Something will trigger them, will bring you back to them, and they will become a part of who you are. And I know that's happening to everybody who visits our museum. And I just focus on that. And if your motivation isn't, doesn't start where my motivation is, I'll, sti I'll still meet you at the finish line, even if it takes you a little longer to get there. 
because that's the way we're going to be better as a society. And I firmly believe we we will collectively get there. And some people are just going to take longer than others. And if there are some people who never quite get there, we'll just keep moving without them. But we're not necessarily going to discount them from society, but we'll just keep moving without them. Questions. We have a, about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for the insightful discussion. I was just wondering if you could speak on some of the mind-heart collisions you spoke about that led you to the path you're on today. Are you a graduate student? <laughs> no. <laughs> Just felt like it felt like a prelim question. And I'm, no, I, I appreciate the question. Um, <clears throat> personally, boy. Um, so I'll, I've had several. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reference one in particular that happened when I was uh, in the ninth grade. I attended high school in Nashville. I went to Father Ryan High School in Nashville, and. Father Ryan is a um, co-ed Catholic high school, for those who may not be familiar. Um, I recall a moment where a friend of mine was, with special needs was being picked on. And I didn't participate in that, but I was a bystander. I, I, what I didn't do is step up and use my voice, and I had a voice. I was an athlete. I was involved in student government. I could have stepped in and said, enough, and I just stood there and let it happen. And I went home and told my parents, I'll never let that happen again. I felt awful. I had a responsibility to support someone who could, could needed the support. And I took a pass. And so that was a, that was a powerful moment for me. I've never forgotten it. And to this day, I think if you were to ask, my colleagues at the National Civil Rights Museum. If, you ever, if, if you've ever seen Wigington um, at a boiling point, it's going to be because of somebody being mistreated. It's never going to happen in any other situation. I have, and, and that was a powerful moment for me. That comes out in in spaces throughout, obviously, some of the exhibits and the dynamic of the museum every day. And uh, I'm also conscious about people not always putting their best foot forward. Does it mean that they get dismissed from society? Like, everybody deserves the right to rectify their mistakes. And so that... That part of, again, what we try to do at the museum is important as well. Hi. Uh, I'd first like to thank you for, you know, just hearing you out. That was amazing. Um, so I just want to speak on a little bit, you know, going to... Uh, PWI, um, I was able to go on a trip uh, over the break, and I went to the museum in Washington, D.C., and I went with a lot of um, African-American men, and when I went, it was eye-opening. Um, you know, going here, I don't usually get a lot of that, so just <clears throat> seeing that type of diversity 
in that different environment was, you know, it was really exciting, but also, you know, different. And I really enjoyed that feeling. And I'm in a couple of programs um, and clubs that encourage or are, um, are like safe spaces for minorities and people that look like me to talk about experiences that we've gone through here um, and things that have happened. And I was just wondering how, you know, we embody that comfortable, like we bring that comfortability here. Um, we kind of spread that message and, you know, we make campus a safe space for everyone all the time and not just in those spaces where um, we have to seek to find people like us because, I mean, I, in all my classes, there's n never a uh, predominantly, you know, African-American or minority class I've ever been in. I'm, I'm even in African studies class, and it's not predominantly African-American or minority. So, yeah, I guess that's my question is, you know, how do we create that safe space everywhere without having to seek it out? And these UT students are nothing to play with, are they? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, well, I think it's it's multifaceted. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna share the responsibility. So the the teacher sets the tone for what happens in the class. I'm a firm believer in that. The culture and the expectations and the uh, how they opt to handle or either handle uncomfortable moments or embrace and step into those moments and model for students how you do that like she used to do and like he does, I'm certain, right? You So if you create that, then the sting of it each time it lessens. So students become begin to expect, well, I'm gonna go in Dr. Fleming's class today. I know it's gonna be at least three zingers, right? And and, and what happens though? Seriously, what happens when, when your expectations change? Because you know everybody's gonna survive. She is going to guide us through whatever moments of uncomfort or discomfort or anxiety that we're having and we're going to get through this and you know if you look around and you see some other wide-eyed nervousness y'all can y'all can be scared together i mean there's nothing like fear that makes people come together right or or discomfort so that's one side the other side is you came to college, you came to this great university for a lot of reasons. And part of that is having practice and the experiences and the maturation process of managing your way through those kinds of situations. So maybe you're not the kind of person who intuitively would step up and take a leadership role in those kind of situations. Well, I, I can promise you this is the best place to get practice doing that. The costs are relatively low. There certainly aren't the costs that they are if you haven't practiced and you wait until post-college to do it. And the worst thing that can probably happen is that you aren't very good at it and you got to practice some more. And this will sound maybe a little corny, but... It's okay to be inspired by historical figures who demonstrated courage in a certain kind of way as motivation. I mean, step into that at your pace, but set a goal that you know what? I'm going I'm going to make this semester in addition to making a 3.75 I'm going to meet five people who look lost and bring them into my hug in my core group. Those are my goals for the semester. 
it makes for a much more fulfilling college and university experience. And I can assure you, when you get to be my age, you won't remember your GPA. You might remember the category, but you won't remember your GPA, but you'll remember those moments. Because those are the people you'll be coming for your 35 year college reunion to come see at homecoming and to reconnect with. Let me just, oops. Let me just say real quickly, because I taught here for 32 years, and let me tell you how much fun I had as one of the few African-American professors on campus. Stand up whenever you can, in, how, in whichever way you think will be effective. And I'll tell you just real briefly about an experience I had. And I can't remember the year, but I publicly accused the University of Tennessee of racism. I held a press conference. I had ABC, CBS, NBC, the Nashville Tennessean, and the Knoxville News Sentinel. And I have never felt more free, because colleagues of mine across this country said, are you crazy? You're going to lose your job. Now, I was tenured, but still, that was kind of interesting. That evening when I went home, I have never felt so free in my entire life. And I went directly into my living room. And I'm one of the few African Americans who's fortunate enough to have pictures of my ex-slave and ex-slave ancestor. And I sat in front of that picture that had my great-grandmother, who was born in slavery, my grandparents, my mother. And I sat there, and I kept saying to them, I did it. I did it for you. Think about the people who came before you, the civil rights workers who made it possible for you to be here, for me to have gone to do, for me to teach here. We owe them. So when you think about how difficult it is, think about what they did to get us to the place where we are. You owe them. I owe them. We all owe them. I wanted to thank you for your work, first of all. Uh, do you have any special activities coming up on the 55th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King? Yes, sir, we do. Um, April 4 is a day that the world comes to Memphis routinely, and, and as the 55th, that will certainly happen. We will have, um, if you think about the, there are, two people still living who were on the balcony on that day. We hope they both are there. Uh, we hope they're both able to come, and that would be uh, Andrew Young and Jesse Jackson. Uh, Jesse Jackson was able to be with us last year, and so we, we hope to have um, that special moment for sure. Uh, we will have... Um, speakers, we will have music, uh, we will have um, opportunity for community gathering in which Dr. King's, many of his speeches will be played throughout the day uh, to have people understand the breadth of what he talked about and to, to, to not focus on one or two speeches in particular, and to recognize that here's a man who spoke about things that were often uncomfortable topics to speak about. Um, here's a man that at the time of his death had a Gallup poll disapproval rating of about 70%. People don't tend to think about that part because of how we uh, imagine him, if you will, today. So we recognize those, um, those elements throughout the day. It's a, it's a very um, reflect, a day of reflection. Uh, we will have, if I'm correct, 
uh, Tiffany, uh, access to the museum uh, sponsored for visitors to um, who might not otherwise have as easy access to the museum uh, from a cost perspective. And so, am I leaving anything out? Oh yeah, I am leaving something out. <laughs> and you can experience it, um, which is a big deal for us as we move to more virtual programming, recognizing not everybody can physically be in the space. So we're hoping that we have a national uh, audience. Um, I think, is that, I always gotta get her nod, thank you. Please uh, join me in, in thanking Dr. Wigington uh, from the National Civil Rights Museum at the Lorraine Motel. Speaking, speaking of upcoming events, uh, the Department of History will hold its eighth annual Fleming Morrow Distinguished Lecture in African American History. Uh, and this year's lecture is gonna be titled America's Real Sister Act, The Hidden History of Black Catholic Nuns in the United States, and that's gonna be from 5.30 to 7 in a Strong Hall, which is just across the bridge right here. All right, so join us uh, for that as well. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Shayla C. Nunnally Violet, and I'm the head of our new Department of Africana Studies here at the University of Tennessee. And it is such a pleasure to be able to thank you for joining us this evening. And I also would like to extend additional special thanks to Dr. Fleming, Dr. Winford, especially Dr. Wigginton for joining us, Dr. Wanamaker, David Smith, as well as Dr. Susan Lawrence with the Department of History and collaborating with us to bring you this program this evening. As I stand before you, I know you're probably thinking she has several colors going on here. Well, that's intentional. Also to highlight that as we are closing out what is Black History Month, what started as Black History Week in 1926, it is important to think about the conversation that we had today, that indeed Africana Studies also has become political. And what that means for how we not only think about what is the history, but what is contemporary society and what was not just erasure, that as we think about the academy, even still, there's an attempt to include what is the study of people of African descent around the world. So for this conversation, I thank you for illuminating the significance of museums in public history and our understanding of what is our nation's past as well as the past of people of African descent around the world. So again, thank you very much for joining us this evening. We have more that actually, Marianne, would you like to come forward? Thank you again for joining us this evening and please join us in the lobby as well.